now, but uh, here. It's an extension of the summer to be here, which is nice. I'm going to talk about the idea of a theory because, for me, this is very interesting, and also because, in my experience uh, working with students working on their doctorates and their master's theses, it's always a big problem. They always seem to find it difficult to know how to relate theory to what they do, to their empirical research. Um, they've got quite a lot of slides, but um, this year I've also brought um, a written summary of what I will say, and I'll give this to Jose, and um, I understand this can be duplicated. It's about eight pages long or something, so it's got a few references at the end, so if you find you get fed up with taking notes, um, at some point there will be a written summary available somewhere. Uh, it's Jose's usual uh, organizing skills, no doubt this will appear on a table somewhere in a restaurant or something. I trust it will appear if anybody wants one. Or the bar. Or the bar or somewhere. Okay. This is, by the way, one of the only international seminars I've ever been to, I think, where serious tutorials can actually be done after midnight. I remember once seeing José starting a tutorial about half past twelve. Amazing. Okay. No, 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 it was, it was in the night. Okay, let's start, uh, we'll start uh, at the beginning. We'll go back to the origin of the, origin of the word. Um, it's worth reminding you, if you don't already know, that the Greek word theoria goes back to the idea of looking, seeing, so that originally a theory is a way of looking at something. Uh, the the uh, people who used to go to the oracle at Delphi in ancient Greece were the, the theore, or whatever the Greek plural is, uh, theoroi perhaps is the correct plural. I don't speak Greek so I can't check that. An interesting word though, they, they were the theoroi who went to the oracle to find out how to look at something to make sense of it. And the oracle would say, aha, a great kingdom will be destroyed, or something. And then you go over and you say, O oh, king, we can go to war after all. Of course, it could be interpreted the other way. Anyway, they were the theoroi, or the people that went to look, to find out how to look at something, to contemplate something in order to understand it. Um, I take understanding then to be um, a very key concept. And as a way of starting to understand understanding, I pick out these four um, implications. The first one is we have to have the right concepts. That makes sense. We talk, began to talk about this yesterday. What is a translation? What kind of concept is it? It's not obvious. Uh, there are many other concepts, of course, in translation theory. Uh, which we probably need to sort out before we go much further. We'll come back to some of them a little later. So you need concepts. And then you need to put these concepts somehow together into some kind of a framework so that we can describe. Describing is one of the primary aims of any science, of course. But we don't stop there. We would also like to be able to explain what we describe. We're interested in questions why or questions how. There are many, many kinds of explanation. That would be the topic of a whole other lecture. But as Jose was saying in the previous discussion a few minutes ago, we need to explain, not just to describe. In some sciences, it's also important to be able to predict. And so some people would say that a theory is uh, something which enables you to make interesting predictions which turn out, you hope, to be true. Uh, predicting is a fairly strong term and it's difficult to apply it to the human sciences. But we can apply it perhaps in a rather looser way. We can say that if we can predict something to some extent, at least we know not to be surprised when it happens. Um, we can anticipate it somehow or other. In Finland, in the winter, the lakes, of course, freeze, and usually some idiot walks across the lake or drives across the lake when the lake is not quite thick enough and they drown. And it's news. I mean, you can't predict that it's going to be you or you or you this year, 
but we can be fairly sure that some idiot will drown because they are young. It's a, you know, we're not surprised when this happens. We have a theory to explain involving human stupidity and all the rest of it. Um, a chair, sir. You cannot surely stand the next Come and be seated if you wish. I'm very sorry. No, please. No problem. Come and, come and, come and be seated. Um, Okay, so a theory, we could say, is some way of uh, trying to get us closer to better understanding. I take understanding to be the kind of the goal rather than truth. I think truth is a bit dangerous. Um, we never seem to, re to reach it, and those people who think they have found it are uh, perhaps... Um, one, one can discuss with them the dangers of the thought that you have found the truth. So maybe it's better to think in terms of understanding. Um, we come back now, I'll go through the list once more. Um, I've begun to think recently, um, under the influence of a, a new concept which has uh, been introduced, the concept of a shadow translation, um, which I, I very much like. It was introduced in an article by, by Steve Johansson target recently. A shadow translation is a translation that could have been used but was not used. Uh, I think we can apply this to the idea of concepts. If you choose a set of concepts to describe whatever it is you want to describe, you are making a choice. They are not the only concepts available. And therefore, I think a serious scholar needs to give consideration to the shadow concepts the ones that you could have used but are not using. And then you need to think, why am I rejecting these, because they are somehow not so useful, not so good, why do I prefer these concepts, or this analysis, or this classification, whatever the concept might be, rather than some other? This is the kind of argument that I would expect a doctoral student to put inside the methodology chapter, or perhaps the theoretical background sort of chapter of your thesis. You make a choice of theory or concept or framework, but it's not enough just to say, I'm going to work with this framework, I'm going to use this. Because the nasty critic would also say, what about that, or that, or that? Why didn't you try these? Why is your choice better than these other ones? And so a good doctoral student, I think, will pay some attention to what I now call the shadow concepts. The ones that you could have used, but didn't. It's also interesting to see that within translation studies itself, some concepts gradually become shadow concepts because nobody uses them anymore. You might even think of some examples. I won't right now go into that. <coughs> Traditionally, in terminology, one uses concept diagrams to show the structure and the relations between the central concepts that you are using. You might not want to do a concept diagram, literally, in your doctoral thesis, but it's a good way to help you to think about relations between concepts. There are standard sorts of relations which you can find in any basic book on terminology theory. That's not what we will look at right now. With respect to description, I find it very stimulating to go back to the great, great tagnemic linguist, Kenneth Pike, in fact, the founder of the institute from which many members come here, the Summer Institute. What's it called? The Summer Institute of Linguistics? That's correct? Yes. Um, the idea that we can think of language or some phenomenon in language at least in three different ways. Um, we can describe it from three different perspectives, if you like. Um, Pike talks about seeing things as a field or a particle or a wave. Sometimes it's useful to see these in combination. Nowadays, we have to think of light, I understand, both as a particle and as a wave. If we can't think of light in both these ways at the same time, we are not grasping the deeper nature of what light is. Don't tell me what light is. This is what I read. That's what I'm told. And to Pike's three ways of looking at a descriptive perspective, we could also perhaps add another one, a functional one. And we could ask questions like, well, what is the use of this particular thing which we're examining, or the value, or the function of it?
when one starts a doctorate, I think one begins often with a question which develops into a set of questions and more and more and more questions. One of the things I do with my own students is to encourage them to take each of these perspectives in turn and then imagine what questions would arise. Imagine that what you're discussing is a field. Um, what kind of questions would you throw at this research object? And then shift your perspective and imagine that you're looking at a particle. What kind of questions would come there? And so on. So you, it's a way of generating questions which then can help you to think. Briefly, a couple of words on, on, on explaining this third aim of a theory, um, in, in my view. Um, traditionally, we think of explaining in terms of causality. This is perhaps the traditional view of explanation, um, going right back to Aristotle and beyond and so on. And philosophers have talked about the different kinds of conditions which you can appeal to in order to arrive at um, an answer, an explanatory answer to a question which answers why or a question which answers how. How is this thing possible? Well, you look for all the necessary conditions in the background, in the context, and then if you find the ones that you think are necessary, then you make your argument. Uh, why did X have to occur? Why is this necessary? You go and look for the sufficient conditions. <coughs> Um, if you're not quite sure of what the difference is between a necessary condition or a sufficient condition, go Google, you will find a dozen of good references which explain to you, explain to you what, how these work. They are not uh, opposites, there is a kind of overlap between them. So, in fact, they look like two overlapping circles. You would have plus sufficient, minus necessary, and all the possible combinations of the other ones in there. Um, so, if, if this is not if you're not familiar with the idea, you can check it out anywhere. Recent work in the philosophy of science <coughs> in the last 10, 20 years or so has begun uh, to think about other ways in which to explain without actually going to causes. And I think these other ways are actually of great relevance to translation theory. Um, I'm writing something about it at the moment, but it's not yet ready. <coughs> um, some translation scholars and some linguists have begun to talk about generalization as a form of explanation. Um, a recent article by Sandra Halverson in Target uh, a couple of years back, uh, the references in, in the handout if you need it, um, discussed this idea. And um, more recently still, there have been people who've argued that uh, unification is a kind of explanation which, which works very well and maybe will replace the idea of explaining in terms of causes. Roughly speaking, an explanation, an explanation which unifies or contextualizes, if you like, shows the way in which the particular phenomenon that you're trying to explain fits into a whole wider pattern in the world or in nature or something. And by showing how your bit fits into all the other bits, you are somehow unifying the description. Um, you are therefore, thereby simplifying the number of laws or, ex or assumptions that you will need to explain this little bit. If you just say that it's part of some bigger bit. Think, for example, of the way in which um, uh, Ernst Alice Gruss argues in his relevance theory that um, Translation is really just a kind of communication. We don't need a translation theory. All we need is a theory of communication, and we can explain everything we need about translation by putting it underneath the communication umbrella. It's an attempt to unify uh, by like, putting one underneath the other. I made this point just a moment, just a moment, excuse me, just a moment ago, but I, w I won't make it. I won't make it again. I just digress for a moment now to um, explain my own position. Um, I think these days it's important for any scholar to say where you're coming from. We have rather lost our faith, I think, not only in the humanities but perhaps also in the physical sciences our faith in complete objectivism or objectivity. 
we all come from a place, we all have a position, we are none of us in a vacuum. Uh, so it's perhaps a good idea in a doctoral thesis too to say what your position is, where are you coming from? What is the way you use your perspective, <coughs> your basic assumptions? No theory is neutral from this point of view. Uh, think of NIDA. NIDA's theories of translation are absolutely rooted in his Christian beliefs in the importance of spreading the word of God. Uh, to take a very simple example. Okay, uh, this, is, this is my position, um, a very standard, normal position, I think, in, in huge fields of scholarship. There's nothing, nothing terribly special about it. Um, I have those sorts of assumptions, um, which I think none of them perhaps are terribly unusual. Perhaps they are shared by most of the people in this room. But it's a position called, called critical realism. But it's, it's not a position which would necessarily, by, would necessarily be adopted by all scholars. So maybe it's a good idea that you to state where you are, where you, where you stand. So I think the uh, last two points are ones I would like to stress. Like to stress, I don't think we ever arrive at perfect understanding. In English, it's perhaps significant that it's a verbal form, it's an ing form. You can always try to find more understanding or better understanding. But if you ever get to the point when you say, aha, I have now arrived at the final truth, uh, at that point, I'm not quite sure how to talk to you. <laughs> Uh, it, it's a different way of seeing things. Okay, so now we come back to, to translation. I've tried to show how these ideas um, have been used in different aspects of translation theory. So this is a simple definition of what a translation theory is. It's a view of translation, or some part of it, which helps us to understand it better, quite simply. <coughs> I'm going to argue that there are five kinds of theory which we find in translation studies, five basic kinds. This is where you may disagree, and this is a point where we may perhaps discuss at the end, because what I'm presenting is actually an interpretive hypothesis. I'm presenting a hypothesis which claims that the idea of theory can be interpreted as five different types. This is my, my classification of theory. But these are not facts, they're not truths, they are, I think, hypotheses which are useful because they allow us to think more clearly about translation, to take them in that sense. Um, <clears throat> I begin with myth and metaphor, which I think are the, the oldest kinds of theories. Um, and we then move to models, hypotheses, and research programs. Um, I'll give examples of all these as we, as we go in just a moment. That's just the big picture, as it were. Um, all my, my academic life I've been influenced by Popper um, and his concept of the hypothesis and how one can use it. Um, and more recently I've been also very interested in the work of Lakatos, another philosopher of science. Um, who was one of Popper's students and colleagues and didn't, didn't agree with everything that Popper said and developed a slightly different view of what a theory was. We come back to those a little later. So, <clears throat> before we take some examples, I just make one comment, which is that traditionally a distinction has been made between the last three models and hypotheses and programs, structures, and the first two. And people have traditionally thought that the last three are the scientific ones. Because they are firmly based on evidence, they are as explicit as possible, and they are testable. Um, yes, true, um, but I think it's also worth pointing out that um, um, scientists also use methods and methods, and they also use myths uh, in order to think in order to communicate what they think. <clears throat> if you say that uh, light is like a particle, um, you are using a metaphor, a metaphor or a simile or an image, if you like. And if you think of the Gaia hypothesis uh, proposed by James Lovelace about, about the planet being a, an organic ecosystem, going back to the myth of Gaia, the, 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 
goddess of the earth, etc., etc. There you have a scientist making use of a myth in order to describe and communicate um, a particular point of view.